I'm going to start off this morning by asking you guys a question. How many of you growing up had somebody that you idolized? Maybe it was an older sibling or somebody, uh, a friend, whatever it may look like. For me, that was my older brother, Grant. He is five years older than me, and the way that I describe him when people talk about him is he is the older, taller, better-looking version of me. And I wanted to do everything like him, but like a true little brother, I didn't want to just do it like him. I also wanted to be better than him. And so even as we've continued to grow, the competitive streak in me uh, has gone a little bit awry. He ran a marathon. I was like, I'm going to beat your time. And I didn't beat it the first time, so like a psychopath, I ran a second one to make sure that I beat his time. And so I just, I spent so much time around my brother that we not only look alike because of our genetics, but we sound alike, we laugh alike, our mannerisms are the same. And I realized as I've grown up that I was very fortunate because my brother led me really well. He is without a doubt one of the best people that I've ever met or ever been around. But some people are not so fortunate. Maybe you're not born into a great family or you're not surrounded by great influences or some people just make bad choices and it results in poor things happening in their lives. And as I was thinking about the kings, this is what I started thinking about because as you read through the books of First and Second Kings, you're going to see people in each of these camps. Some of them were born into a great family. They had great parents and they made great decisions. Some of them were born into horrible families and they followed in that line of horrible decisions. And some were born into really good families, but still made poor choices. And so when we look at the kings of Israel, you're going to have this divided nation. You have the nation of Israel in the north, and you have the nation of Judah in the south. And both of them have 20 kings that you're going to read about. And the nation of Israel goes 0 for 20. Not a single good king in all of Israel's history throughout that. And the southern kingdom of Judah has 8 out of 20. So being a baseball guy, I'm like, okay, you're 8 for 40. You're hitting 200. That's very, very bad. That's not where we want to be as far as kings, people that we're following, and how they're pointing us towards God. And so today what we're going to talk about is we're going to look at these two prophets primarily. And these two prophets who speak to the kings that are trying to remind them, this is what you should be doing. This is how you should be obeying God and following God. And this is the areas where you're falling short. And so uh, I'm going to talk about Elijah, and I'm going to talk about Elisha, who comes after him uh, and has a little bit of that little brother complex as well. So before I jump into the text, I want to pray. Would you guys pray with me? King Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. It's so good to worship together with your people. Uh, as Tassie was saying, I, I love being here uh, on Sunday mornings. I love being here throughout the week as I'm just being in community uh, with this group of people and getting the opportunity to walk life alongside them uh, and see the impact that it has on me, the influence it has on me, uh, on my children, on my friends, and the people that we get to do life with. And so I'm so thankful for this place and for this time. And Lord, as we continue to work through your word, I pray that it would continue to work through us, that our goal is not just pushing people through the word of God, but making sure that the word of God gets in us, that it gets into our hearts, that it gets lived out through our hands, God, that we love people the way that you loved us, and that we see you continually showing up on every page of scripture and speaking to our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray for that this morning. I pray that as I speak, uh, you would speak, God, that I would get out of your way and that I would be able to hide behind the cross and that your message would come through, that you would speak to us uh, this morning as we enter into your word. We ask this in your son's precious name. All your people said, amen. So each week as we are going through the whole story, we are trying to orient you with where we are. So whether you have been reading along with us this whole year as we've been going through the Bible in a year, whether you're a few days or a few weeks behind, or whether this is your first time here and you're wondering what I'm talking about, we want to let you know where we are in the story. So last week on Easter, Jason talked about David. And he talked about this Davidic covenant, this covenant that God made with David that said, you're always going to have a man on the throne. And it pointed us forward to Jesus, that Jesus was part of this line of David, this line of kings that is going to rule over his nation, over his people. And as you get into the reading, you're entered into 1 Kings this week. And we're going to be in 1 Kings this week. Next week, we'll jump into 2 Kings. These were written as one book. And as you read them, you're going to see what's going to happen is you're going to get the story of these 40 different kings of these two different nations, the tribe of Israel and the tribe of Judah and the kings that were supposed to lead them. And they don't do a good job, as I kind of prefaced earlier. And so next week, Jason's going to talk about that, kind of starting with Solomon. What did it look like to go from David to Solomon and to these other kings and where did they kind of go awry? But this week, what I'm going to talk about is the prophets. Now, 
what I want to talk to you about is who are the prophets? What do they do? More importantly, what do they not do? And so uh, I put this graphic up here so that you can kind of see what the prophets are responsible for and the things that they're not. They were there to keep watch over the law of God, right? So we have the law, those first five books of the Old Testament that tell us these are the things you should do, these are the things you should not do. And primarily, they were speaking to kings. So they were speaking on behalf of God to these kings, making sure that they were paying attention to what God was telling them to do and that they did not go astray from it. And this is where we're going to pick up our story today. So we're going to get through some of Kings, and we're going to pick up uh, this morning in 1 Kings chapter 16, and this is going to introduce us to one of the worst kings in all of Israel's history. Starting in verse 29 of chapter 16, it says this, In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, the son of Omri, began to reign in Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel and Samaria 22 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the sons of Nebat, he took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab made an Asherah. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Okay? So this sets the stage for Ahab. He's obviously a bad guy. He's not spoken of well. As you read through the kings, you're going to see that recurring phrase. He either did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, or he did not do what the Lord wanted him to do. Now, in order to understand this, you have to understand a little bit about who Baal was, because why is the worship of Baal so bad? This goes all the way back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 6, you get the Shema, right? It's this prayer that talks about, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, right? And it's to be repeated in their homes, and they are talking about who God is. It's this reminder of who he is. And then later in chapter 6, it tells them, do not worship other gods, right? It's this continual reminder, do not worship other gods. And then if you fast forward to the book of Judges, we see in the story of Gideon that Gideon breaks down an altar to Baal and also the Asherah. So as they entered into the promised land, one of the things that happened was they began to worship foreign gods. They didn't drive the people fully out, and they began to worship foreign gods, including Baal. Now, part of worshiping Baal was that it was, he was a very sexualized god, So there was temple prostitution. Uh, There was also child sacrifice. So Baal was in charge of two things primarily. It was the fertility of the land and the fertility of people. And so if your land was not growing crops the way that it should, the required sacrifice was your firstborn child. So the firstborn of the person making uh, or coming to and asking Baal to deliver, they would have to give up their own child. So there's a lot of evil in the midst of the worship of him. And another thing that you'll see in the story later is these cuts. It was self-mutilation that people would do before the altar of Baal to get him to do what they wanted. And so this is what's kind of setting the stage for this interaction between Elijah the prophet and Ahab the king. Now in 1 Kings 17, Elijah comes to Ahab and he tells him there's going to be a famine in the land. There's going to be a drought in the land. I'm sorry. For three years, it's not going to rain. And what it's doing, what he's trying to do in the midst of this, is he's trying to show him that God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, who you should be serving, is the one who is in control of all of creation. He is the one who determines when it rains and when it doesn't. This has nothing to do with Baal, this false God whom you are worshiping. And so he pronounces this, and it happens. So he pronounces this, then he goes and hides because he doesn't want the king to kill him. And he's being fed by the birds, and God's providing for him out in the wilderness. Then three years later, we see this interaction between the two of them. So the Lord tells Elijah to go back. And in chapter 18, verses 17 to 19, we see this interaction. When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. 
So this is the equivalent of saying it's going down in the parking lot, right? Like he's calling him out. He's like, get here, make sure everybody's here to watch. So this is all of the false prophets of the two gods that they're serving. But he's saying, bring all Israel because they need to see this and they need to hear this. Now, if you're not familiar with this story, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of what happens, okay? So all Israel shows up to observe the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and Asherah. And this is what Elijah says to the nation of Israel. As the nation's saying there, he says, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Okay, so he puts this challenge out to all the people. Whoever is God, follow. And I'm gonna prove to you who God is by throwing down this challenge. And so he takes all the prophets of Baal and he says, here's the deal. You're gonna get a bull and I'm gonna get a bull. We're both gonna make altars. You make your altar, I'm gonna make my altar. And whoever's God answers by fire, whoever's God answers by fire and consumes this offering, that's who God is. They said, deal, let's do it. He says, you go first. And so they go and they get up there, they build their altar, they put the bowl on there, they begin dancing around, they begin cutting themselves and Elijah's just sitting there laughing. So for three hours from the morning, about nine o'clock until noon, they're dancing around, they're calling out to Baal, they're saying, hey, we need you to burn up this sacrifice so that we don't look like idiots in front of the whole nation. And Elijah is sitting there mocking them. And he gets to this point in 1 Kings 18, 27, where he says this, cry aloud for he is God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself or he's on a journey or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. So he's openly mocking him. He's like, your God must be taking a three hour dump. That's why he's not burning the sacrifice for you. Or maybe he's on vacation. Like he just took off somewhere and is not gonna be there. He's mocking them to point out to all of Israel, this is not a God. They are talking to the air right now. They're worshiping nothing. They're not going to get an answer because there's no one there. And then he says this, enough. He prepares his own altar, sets the bowl on there, digs a trench around it. Then he asks everybody, bring me jugs of water. So they bring him jugs of water. He pours it all over the altar, pours it all over the sacrifice, all over everything. Bring me more water, does it again does it until the trench around there is full. Now, I'm not an Eagle Scout, but I do know that the antidote to fire is water. So he's trying to make a point. He's doubling down and recognizing, not only is my God big enough to answer, he's big enough to burn up a soaking wet sacrifice in the midst of that. And this is exactly what happens. Pick back up in chapter 18, verses 36 to 40. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. Verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them and Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and slaughtered them there. Point proven, right? He wants to make sure that they understand. Now, after the showdown, the interesting thing is he goes to Ahab and he tells Ahab, you can go home. So Ahab goes home and he cries to his wife, Jezebel, this evil person, tells her everything that happened. And Jezebel says, I'm going to kill Elijah. So she sends a messenger to Elijah that says, if your head remains on your body by tomorrow, something has gone wrong. I'm going to kill you. And so he runs away and he's in the wilderness and he's hiding. And after this amazing miracle, he's sitting down and he's weeping and he's afraid. And he's like, God, just kill me. Just kill me. I don't want to do this anymore. This is too hard. This is too difficult. And this is one of my favorite pieces of scripture because God's like, you know what? Just take a nap. Take a nap. Wake up, eat some food, drink some water, take a nap, repeat. Now, if there's a prescription in scripture that I can follow, it's when I'm grumpy, eat some chips and salsa and take a nap, right? Like so much is improved by just those two things. And the Lord speaks to him afterwards and he reminds him that he is not alone. Then he also flips the script because in chapter 21, what he does is he predicts the death of Jezebel. This is one of the prophecies that will come true as a part of his ministry, that he predicts how she's going to die and how it's going to go down. 
But the point of this story is to see that God is God, that Yahweh, the God that they are supposed to be worshiping, is God and not Baal. And this is also the point in the story where we see the crossover between these two prophets, between Elijah and the prophet that he is going to train up and release, who is Elisha. And so I want to introduce this part in chapter 19, verses 19 to 21. It says this, So he, this is Elijah, departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the twelfth. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yokes of oxen and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and went after Elijah and assisted him. So when Elisha gets this call, he goes back and he kisses his parents. And if you see right before this, this is one of the, the interesting things. The only two times this phrase is used of him kissing somebody is this separation from something. So he is saying that he's done with his parents, right? He is removing himself from their yoke, and he is now binding himself to Elijah. And then to make sure that he does that, he doubles down on it. He breaks all the yoke down. He sacrifices his oxen. He feeds them to the people. You have to understand that this was his means of livelihood. These 12 yoke of oxen, which made him a pretty wealthy person, were now worth nothing because they were in the bellies of people. So he's saying, there's nothing for me to come back to. I'm all in. So he goes all in and following him. And for the next 10 years, you see them traveling together as they're performing miracles, as they're prophesying, as they're serving the Lord. And if you look at their lives and look at their stories, you're going to see a lot of crossover between the two. And so there's nine different ways that their lives parallel one another. And I'm going to put these up on the screen. They're just going to be in chunks. So take out your phone because you're going to want to take pictures of these. And I'm not going to work through each of these. But what it is, is there's going to be a parallel between their life. And then it's going to talk about how this looked in the life of Elijah how it looked in the life of Elisha, and where you find it in Scripture. And so you have these nine different ways that their uh, lives cross over. And the first one that I'll highlight is the way that they both cared for widows. Throughout the Old Testament, you see this uh, idea come up over and over and over again, that we are to care for the widows, the orphans, and the sojourners, or the refugees. And both of them have a story of how they did that. When Elijah enters into Zarephath, he asks a widow to give him some food. And she says... I only have this little bit left. I'm going to make this little bit of bread. My son and I are going to eat it, and then we're going to die. Okay, this is in the middle of that three-year famine that he had predicted. And so when there's no water, there's no food, he says, don't worry about it. Trust the Lord. The flour's not going to run out. Your oil's not going to run out. So she feeds him. And for the entire time, until the rains come again, she has oil and she has flour in that same jar. It's an incredible miracle. And then you read the story that Elijah performs, a, or Elisha performs a similar miracle. He goes in and there's a woman whose two sons are about to be sold into slavery because of debts that she had. And she only has this little flask of oil. And he says the same thing, give me a little something to eat. And she trusts that he's going to deliver on it. And what he tells her is that you need to go, all of your neighbors, you and your sons, go to all your neighbors, get every empty vessel that you can get your hands on and bring them back into the house. So they do that. They fill the house with all of these things. They lock the door, and he says, begin pouring. So she pours this oil into every single vessel and fills it to the brim, and when the last vessel is filled, the oil stops. He says, go sell all that, free your sons from slavery, and use the rest to live off of. God's going to provide for you in the midst of that. Now, in both of these circumstances, they were in dire straits. These are not circumstances where you're typically giving anything away. Right? When somebody asks you for something and you're in a mountain of debt, your kids are about to be sold to slavery, you're about to die of hunger, you're not in the mood to give things away. But these people showed a complete trust in God in the midst of a really difficult circumstance that wouldn't normally warrant it. Now, the second crossover that you see that I want to highlight is this execution of God's judgment. Now, I already told the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal, but the second one is wild, and when you get to the story, I don't want you to be completely thrown off, and so I wanted to at least mention it. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 24, you're going to read this story. It says this, he, this is Elisha, this is right after Elijah gets carried up in the chariot of fire, he went up from there to Bethel, 
And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there, he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there, he returned to Samaria. Right? Just, just your run-of-the-mill story of 42 boys being torn up by she-bears. Well, if you read this story at face value, it sounds absolutely bonkers, right? But you have to understand some of the context of what was going on here. So as he's returning to Bethel, Bethel was supposed to be this place where people worship the Lord. But what it had become was this hotbed of apostasy. I talked about apostasy a few weeks ago. It's this turning away from your beliefs, your foundational beliefs. And these people had turned away from them. And not only had they turned away from God, they were turning others away from the worship of God. And so it became this place that was a really, really negative area. And it was raising up really negative youth. And so one of the other things that you have to understand about this is that when they are mocking Elisha, they're not mocking Elisha. They're mocking a prophet of God who represents God. So what they're actually doing is they're mocking God. It's not about him being bald, right? This is not an oversensitivity to not having hair. This is a reflection of their view towards God. And so they're mocking him. The third thing, which is a little bit less, but this is him by himself, verse 40 to 50 youths, right? These unruly youths. So there's a physical element to this that he could be in danger, But in the midst of it, he stands up. He's the only one. And this is the correlation that we have to see, that there's going to be times in your life, just as there were times in the lives of Elijah and Elisha, where they stood alone. They were the only one who believed in God, who were telling people what they should do in order to follow God when everybody else was doing something different. And we have to ask ourselves the same question. In your family, in your friend group, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, you might be the only believer. You might be the only one who is standing up for truth. Will you continue to do that even when everybody else is doing something else? Now, the third parallel that we see is the prediction of the death of a monarch. Now, I shared about how Elijah had prophesied the death of Jezebel, but I didn't go into details of this. So basically what he said was that her flesh was going to be eaten by dogs, which is oddly specific and really gross. But there's this scene later on when you get down to it where uh, a man goes into Jezreel. His name is Jehu. This is found in 2 Kings 9. And Jezebel's all dressed up. It talks about how she painted her face. And what it's trying to communicate is that she was dressed up like one of the wives of Baal, this God who she was trying to lead people astray into worship. And so as Jehu enters into this town, She's up in this tower, and she's mocking him, and she's making fun of him. And he looks up there, and he sees a couple other guys, and he says, who is for me? And these Enochs, who were in service of the king, took Jezebel, and they threw her out the window. Splat, right? Blood goes everywhere. Jehu's like, cool, that's taken care of. I'm going to go to dinner. So he continues on to this banquet, and it says that he just is eating at this banquet, and he realizes, you know what? She's a daughter of a king. She deserves a proper burial. And so he tells one of his servants, he's like, go get Jezebel, let's give her a proper burial. And the servant goes out and comes back and he said, "Uh, so good news, bad news scenario here. I found part of her. I found her skull and the bones of her hands. Everything else had been eaten by dogs. So probably not going to be a funeral. And this is one of those prophecies that we see where Elijah had predicted this, and he had told her this is what's going to happen. Now, Elisha has a very different story. There's a king that's sick. The king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, is sick. And he is bedridden, and so he sends his servant to go and ask Elisha if he's going to get well. And so this servant pulls up to Elisha. His name is Hazael. And he asks him, is the king going to get better? Is Ben-Hadad going to improve from the sickness that he has? And Elisha says, yeah, he's going to get better. But then he gets really sad. And Hazael is wondering, why are you sad? You just told me that he's going to get better. He said, well, the Lord has shown me what you're going to do. He showed me that you're not only going to kill him, but you're going to kill a bunch of other people and do a bunch of really evil things. And it made him sad. And so he's sitting face to face with this guy who he knows is going to go back and murder the king and is going to then in turn murder a bunch of other people in really, really horrible ways. 
but he still speaks that truth to him, knowing the type of person that he is. And this was really, really hard because they're speaking to people who not only want them dead, but have the authority and the ability to do it without any repercussions. They're speaking into power in ways that most people would be unwilling to do. And I think that that's something that's really important for us to recognize is that they were bold in the midst of really, really difficult circumstances. And this boldness is something that we see kind of in the, the final transition between these two, which I really love this story. So in 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 9, uh, we see this story where Elijah and Elisha are walking along together. It says, when they had crossed, this is they crossed the Jordan, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, please let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And he said, you have asked a hard thing. So he's saying, you've asked a hard thing. And the reason this is a hard thing, Elijah's done a lot in his life. If you read through these, these stories, you're going to see that there were a lot of miracles, there were a lot of prophecies, that God used him in some powerful ways. But he continues on and says this, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And so the reason that he's saying that this is a difficult thing is if you look at the life of Elijah, you're going to see different lists that are put together. If you Google this, you can see that some people say that he did seven miracles. Some people said eight. Other people say 14 because they're including some of the prophecies and some of the other things that he did. So either way, asking for a double portion of this blessing is saying, I want to do 14, 16, or 28 miracles or prophecies. I want God to use me in this bigger way. I told you he had a little brother complex, right? Like, I don't want to just do what you did. I want to do twice as much as you did. And what he tells him is, if you see me when I'm being taken up, then your request will be granted. So they're walking along the road, and mid-conversation, a chariot of fire with horses of fire scoops Elijah up and is taking him to heaven. Now, if you've ever driven up to Flagstaff, you know that there's like some patches there where if you're on a phone call, it's just going to get dropped. Like Britt did school up there, and so we would be talking, and she'd be like, this phone call is about to drop. If you have anything important to say, say it now. Otherwise, I'll talk to you in 10 minutes. So I can picture that. I cannot picture walking alongside somebody and watching a chariot of fire scoop them up and take them up to heaven. But this is what happens. The cloak drops. He sees it, so he knows, okay, well, I'm going to receive this double blessing. And so when you go through their lives, you can begin to parallel their stories. And this is what's really cool is if uh, you look at the miracles, which I'm going to list the miracles and the prophecies. So same thing. You're going to take out your phone because there's 14 of these for Elijah. There's 28 for Elisha. So I listed these out so you have the scripture reference. And the reason that I wanted to list these out is so that as you're reading through First and Second Kings, you can see these. It's incredible as you walk through and see these stories and recognize that there's something bigger going on, that there's an answer to this double blessing that's happening in the midst of this. And so I'm just going to have those kind of scroll through in the background. And same thing, I'm not going to discuss them all in depth, but I want you to kind of see what happens in the midst of these stories. So one of my favorite stories of Elisha as this kind of transfer of power happens is the Syrian army. So the Syrian army, as you read about this, keeps trying to attack. But every time they try and attack, their plans are thwarted. They recognize when they get there that somebody already knows their battle plans, right? This is like Bill Belichick having other teams' playbooks for all those years, right? Where they're trying to do something, but the other team already knows what play they're running. And so they get really frustrated. And they're like, why does this keep happening? And this guy says, well, Elisha, this prophet of God, keeps telling them what you're going to do. And so the Syrian king says, send the army to go kill this guy. And so the army is going, and they surround this place that he's in. And his servant goes out one morning, and he just looks, and he's like, oh, no. We're surrounded. We have nothing. And he goes back in, and he tells Elisha, we're surrounded. We're in a lot of trouble. Why do you not look concerned? And Elisha says, there's more for us than are for them. And I just picture the servant standing there like, you haven't looked outside. There's two of us. There's a, there's a whole army out there. We have nothing. There are not more of us than there are of them. But then Elisha asked the Lord to open his eyes. And when he opens his eyes, he sees the Lord's army surrounding the Syrian army. 
It's this picture where you kind of think, oh, this is, this is going to go down, right? Like the Lord's army is going to kill all these people. Instead, he strikes them with blindness and leads them away, and he goes and serves them a meal. Like it is so counter to what we would think it is, but it is this show of God's power over that and that there is something going on that's so much bigger than what we see, right? If you look in Ephesians, you can see that there are spiritual forces that are at work, but God is at work above all of that, and he is providing for us. He is protecting us in the midst of that. And as you wind through the life of Elisha, you're going to see that there's 27 different miracles and prophecies, and then he dies, which seems really weird. It's one short. Why does this happen? Well, I want you to look at 2 Kings 13, verses 20 and 21. It says this, So when Elisha died, they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year, and as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. Miracle 28. Double blessing secured. This is just a testament to God that in full service of him, you can be used even in your death. The testimony, the life of Elisha still continued to produce miracles even after the fact and God was faithful to his word in that. Their job was to remind the kings of the goodness of God, of the law of God, of the things that they were supposed to be doing, and they did that. Although the people continued to go astray, they continued to point them back to God. So what do we would take away from today? I want to go back to a few of the things that I shared earlier, because I want to highlight three things that I see from this life of Elijah, Elijah to the life of Elijah, this transference that they have, the things that he trains them, the things that he teaches them, because we talk about this in discipleship, in mentoring, that there are people in our lives that we need to be following after and that need to be following after us. As we are learning things about God, as we are digging into the scriptures, we need to not only be learning from people who have been down the road further, but also need to be bringing along those who are brand new to this. And so the first thing that I want you to see <clears throat> is that there's times when following God is going to be lonely. I talked about this time when Elijah is facing down the prophets of Baal and Ashereth, right? He is one. They are 850. He's standing alone in the midst of this. It's a difficult time, and you might find yourself there, right? You might be the only person in your circle of friends that's following Jesus, you might be the only person in your family, which is the case for me, that's following Jesus. And it's a difficult spot to be, but you need to recognize that you're not alone. Look around you. There's an entire body of believers. This is what God provided for us. The church, we, church, the big C church, we are the hope of the world. This is God's chosen instrument to tell people the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we're not in this alone. One of the things that I wrote down is it's always the right time to do the right thing. God's going to provide for you in the midst of that if you continue to stand up for him and continue to do the right thing. The second thing that I want to point out that I see Elijah teaching Elisha is how to be bold. There's going to be times when sharing your faith is scary. I was thinking about this last week. Last week during Easter, we had five people stand up here and share their testimonies. I talked about testimonies being this opportunity for us to share our faith with other people, to lend them our faith, and as those who are listening, to borrow that faith. And as a result of that, there's more people that want to be baptized. When we are bold in sharing our faith, when we're sharing our testimony, our testimony is a story of what God has done in our lives. It's not about our power. It's not about the things that we've done, the greatness in us. It's about our brokenness and our inability to get to heaven, to reconcile with God that Jesus did that on our behalf. As we share that story, we embolden others to share theirs as well. Anytime I have people share testimonies, it reminds me of this quote. It says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. 
We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. We need to be bold. The third and final thing that I see from Elijah to Elisha is this message to trust God completely. Now, they were in some pretty precarious spots, both individually and together, that normally you would try and rely on your own strength. You would try and navigate your way out of. But together, they trusted God. And I want to ask you this question here today. What is it that's preventing you from trusting God completely? For some of you, it might be this idea of your future. God, what are you going to do? Where am I going to work? Where am I going to live? Who am I going to marry? What about kids? What about my family? You ask all these questions. You try and white-knuckle your way into controlling those situations and trying to wrestle those away from God. Some of you might say that it's your finances, right? I trust God, but I also trust my 401k more. Like, I believe that God will provide, but I'm also setting something aside just in case he doesn't. Or you might be in my camp that you have to trust God with relationships or with your family. I pray for my kids every single day. I try and disciple my kids. I try and love my kids. I try and point them towards Jesus. The reality is my kids are on loan from God. I cannot control their future as much as I may want to. My family. I told you I'm the only believer in my family. I pray for my family every single day. I want them to know Jesus. It's been a 20 plus year prayer. I haven't seen that answer. I want to will my family into heaven. I can't. I have to release that to God. What are the things that we are not trusting God with? Now, as we release those things to God, God's going to do something with them. Tassie said earlier, there's times where we thank God for his yeses, but there's also times when we need to thank him for his noes, because those noes can form us into the image of God. They force us to trust him with things that we normally wouldn't. If we got all the things that we wanted when we wanted them, we would not learn to trust and rely on Jesus the way that we should. So right now I want to take us into a time of prayer. And I want you to spend some time asking God, what is it that I need to release? What is it that's standing in the way of me and trusting you completely? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this moment. I know that there was, uh, there was some sting in that, uh, in, in writing that and prepping that and you asking me that and in having to confront the fact that I want so badly to will those I love into following you, into a relationship with you. And at times I have ceased trusting you and tried to trust in myself for the ability to do that. God, you've asked me to plant seeds. You've asked me to water. Ultimately, it will come to you for the growth. And I don't know where, where everybody is in this room, but I can guarantee that there are some things for each person in here that are preventing them from trusting you fully. God, if there are any things that ever stand in our way, of total obedience, of total trust in you, I pray that you would rid those from us. Oftentimes that's going to be painful, but Lord, ultimately it's for our good, it is for our growth that we get those things out. And as we read these stories of the Israelites and everybody that are worshiping false gods, that are bowing down to false idols, and we try to remove ourselves from that and think we are better than that, God, we are no better than that. Our hearts our idol factories, as Tim Keller used to say. We are so good at replacing you with so many other things on the throne of our heart. And so God, I pray that these moments that we get in stillness and silence, times of reflection, we can ask you once again to sit on the throne of our heart, to lead us towards you, to guide us towards you, to help us to be bold, to help us to be courageous also to follow. Lord, we 
thank you for this time. We thank you for this place. We thank you for the opportunity to rest, to reflect. During this next song, I'm going to invite the ushers to come up here. Uh, we're going to receive communion. And if you are new to the church, not sure what communion is, this is an opportunity for us to reflect on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. His interaction with the disciples in the upper room right before he died. He told them that this is a way for them to remember him, that every time they gathered they were to take the bread and they were to drink the cup, that it would remind them of the sacrifice that he was about to make, giving himself up for us, giving his body for us so that our sins could be atoned for. And so as you take that bread, as you take that cup, this is a reminder of us of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to come up and take it and bring it back to your seat. And I want you to spend some time praying, similar to... This, this prayer that Tassie mentioned, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know me. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any hurtful way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. God, what are the idols that I've put on my heart that need to move? How do I need to clear the way for you to sit back on there? And take some time to listen for an answer. Don't speed through that prayer and take the elements and be on your way. Sit in that for a moment. Enjoy some time with Jesus and receive the elements and we'll finish up with one last song.